Jan over here. Great. Okay. So um, I just want to take a step back. Um, so I'm from the National Oceanography Centre, um, and I have a PhD in oceanography. Um, and I went to university up in Edinburgh before doing my PhD, and did a very broad um, undergraduate in environmental geoscience. Um, and somehow I've wound my way through and specialised into kind of the ocean sciences. Um, I'm not doing research anymore. I do a lot of kind of science kind of policy work. Um, so communicating the science that's done at the Oceanography Centre outwards to a wider audience, and so I'm here today. And I just want to take a step back and kind of repeat a little bit of what Ralph said, because I think it's really important that if you think about where we are on planet Earth, it's probably not necessarily aptly named, because actually we are a blue planet, um, and 70% of the Earth is actually covered by the ocean, which has been cut off, which is nice. Um, and so we've really got to think about, you know, trying to understand the oceans and how they function and the, the animals and the marine biology that lives in there. And so that's what oceanographers does and do. And recently I've had a few people come up to me and say, well, actually, what is oceanography? And so you might know, but just to make sure we're all kind of in the same place, oceanography is a branch of science that looks and deals with the physical and biological properties and phenomena of the sea. So it's a bit of everything. It's physics, it's biology, it's chemistry. It covers a, a very wide range of disciplines. And I want to talk today mostly about marine biology, which is effectively the scientific study of what lives in the ocean. And so you might think, on the face of it, that's just looking at crabs and seaweed and dolphins and whales and all the things that are really kind of obvious. But actually, there are other organisms in the ocean that live there, like the, this, uh, this guy, blobfish, probably like one of the ugliest creatures in the ocean, but he lives there in the deepest parts of the ocean, and we don't know very much about, about him. And so there's real kind of potential and scope with marine biology to, to do a lot with it. Marine biology is about looking not just at the big things, but the really small organisms that live in the ocean. So this guy is a coccolithophore, and he's actually microscopic, so this is not a to scale image. He's like a thou thousandth of a millimetre in size, so you can't see him with a naked eye, you have to have really high powered microscopes. But these are effectively the plants of the ocean, and they float around freely, and they photosynthesize like plants on land, and they're really important for um, the global carbon cycle, and also as a base of the food web for larger organisms to feed off. And so it's also about looking at the larger organisms that are sustained by the microscopic organisms like the coccolithophore through the food chain. So it's about looking at the, um, the mammals of the ocean and the whales and the really big things. And marine biology, you can also look at it from space, as Ralph mentioned in his talk. So using satellites, you can look at the reflectivity of the ocean surface. And here you can see patches of kind of much lighter, lighter areas of the ocean, which is where um, the satellite's picking up kind of very high reflectance. And this is from, for example, like the coccolithophores that we mentioned in the previous slide. They're made out of calcium carbonate or chalk, and so they're really shiny, effectively, and reflect light back up to the satellites. And so satellites can pick up when blooms of these organisms are occurring. So you can actually look at the biology of microscopic organisms from space, which is pretty cool. But we can also look at the biology in the deep ocean. So here's a picture of the, the sea floor, and you can see lots of these uh, kind of gelatinous looking blobs, which are actually sea cucumbers, or holothurians, um, and they're a creature that lives in the, the deep kind of abyssal plains of the ocean, and they kind of mince around, crawl around, eating the sediments and helping with the kind of the cycling of carbon. Marine biology also exists in really inhospitable environments, and it's become very well adapted to living there. So it lives, you find a lot of biology in the polar regions where humans would really struggle to exist. Um, and again, like Ralph was talking about, you find biology in the really deepest kind of parts of the ocean, these hydrothermal vents or the black smokers, um, where people didn't expect life to exist because of the harsh conditions and the high temperatures. But actually, on closer inspection, you can see all sorts of things like tube worms and limpets um, and sea spiders. And so it's just it's amazing where the biology can live. So we do this, we get, we get out into the oceans using ships and robots to take us to the areas that we want to study and find out more about the biology. And we collect it and we use sometimes fairly basic kit. So we use nets and buckets and bottles and floats um, and incubators. I'm not sure where that's gone, but 
here's here, a picture of some incubators where we can take samples of water with plankton, these microscopic organisms in it, um, and replicate the conditions that they live in in the ocean, the different light levels, and see how they behave and take up nutrients um, and oxygen and things like that. Um, and a lot of this kit we've used for many, many years at sea, but actually it's a really good way of collecting the biology and collecting data. So it's not necessarily all about technology, although that does really help as well. So what you might be thinking, some of you thinking, I don't care about biology, it doesn't do anything for me, you know, nice to see some pretty pictures, but what? Why should I care? Well, realistically, the biology in the oceans is potentially where your great, 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 great to power of many your grandfather or your grandparents were. Life evolved from the oceans. It crawled out from the kind of the single celled organisms that evolved and eventually got out onto land and that's how life kind of came about to where we are today. Marine biology is also really important because the phytoplankton, like the coccolithophores that we mentioned previously, they photosynthesize. So they're like plants on land and they create oxygen. Um, and actually about 70% of the oxygen that we breathe comes from the oceans. So if the biology in the oceans wasn't there, we'd be pretty stuck. The oceans are also really important for storing um, carbon. So anthropogenic carbon, that's fossil fuels that are cut up the, it's the fossil fuel for burning, producing carbon dioxide from human activities. And the uh, scientific community believes and has um, found data to show that about 47% of um, anthropogenic carbon is in the atmosphere. Um, about 27% is stored on the land in kind of plant biomass as they photosynthesize and take up the carbon dioxide. But about 26% um, is in the oceans. So again, if we didn't have the oceans and the marine biology photosynthesizing and taking up the carbon and transferring it into the food webs of the oceans, that 26% would have to be redistributed, probably a lot of it, into the atmosphere. So the oceans are really important for that as well. The oceans can also impact on human health. So um, this guy here is a dinoflagellate, which I don't know if you're trying to ask, but Charlotte could talk to you for hours about dinoflagellates because she did her PhD in them. Um, and they can be really beautiful. They're small, quite, uh, you can only see them under a microscope, really. Um, and they can bioluminesce, so they produce this kind of blue, sparkly um, glow in the oceans. And again, ask Charlotte for a lovely video of this time. Um, but when they uh, bloom and they grow in high enough numbers, um, they can form these red tides and they can be really toxic to human health. So actually understanding um, where the condi how, what conditions are, cause these blooms and when they're going to form and where they're going to form is really important. And a future avenue for marine biology is actually discovering um, what the, kind of, the genetics of marine biology is about. Um, and uh, there's a kind of a a movement which says that potentially there's a lot of health cures um, which we could find if we understood the genetics of a lot of the kind of the rare species within the oceans. Um, and bearing in mind that only 5% of the world's oceans have been explored, there's huge potential for kind of genetic discovery um, in there. Um, food. The oceans is also, are also important for food, fisheries and aquaculture. A billion people in the world rely on fish as their primary animal protein. Um, and as you're all probably aware, fishing and making sure we're sustainably fishing is really kind of key and it's something that we're not necessarily doing very well as a global society and we need to work on. Um, and so we need people to really understand how um, the population dynamics of fish work and how um, we can best kind of manage our stocks. Um, and agriculture is another way where we could potentially produce enough food through fisheries, it's effectively fish farming, but again it's, um, there needs to be a lot more work and investment done into this. So maybe I've convinced you that marine biology is important for life, for oxygen, for carbon storage, for food, for health, and you're thinking, okay, well, you know, what should I do next? I think the thing to remember is that biology and marine biology isn't just about the animals. It's also about the chemistry and the physics and the technology and the engineering and the biotechnology. So it's really important to think broadly and to keep um, your maths and science and other science subjects going alongside the biological side. Um, and if you end up doing an oceanography degree or a marine biology degree, um, the sorts of things you could end up doing is working for research or advisory bodies. So I work for the National Environmental Research Council, so that's kind of the role that I've ended up in. 
Um, you can also end up as uh, an actual researcher or working for environmental charities and pressure groups. You can work in commercial fisheries, trying to help manage the stocks properly. Um, you could work for DEFRA or the Environment Agency, consultancy companies, oil and gas. There's, there are a lot of different opportunities there, and there are lots of transferable skills you'll gain. So think quite broadly about how you might apply your skills and what you're doing into kind of marine biology world. So that's me. Thank you very much. That was a very, very good slide to end on because the point I would make about any career that's involved in the oceans, and particularly one underwater, is you will be mixing with lots of different people with lots of different skills. Any of these skills we've just been talking about there, and any of these technologies you might be wanting to be